Are we ready, folks? How are we doing in the webcast studio in the Exploratorium? Oh, whoa, do we have an audience here today. Welcome to another episode of Iron Science Teacher. My name is Jessica Sparkles Parker, and I am the Director of Teaching and Learning here at the Exploratorium. I am your host for the show. And we are here at Pier 15 in San Francisco and broadcasting live across the internet. Audience, audience are you excited? <laughs> Yes, it's a monumental moment here at the Exploratorium because we are celebrating not our 10th anniversary, not our 20th, not our 30th or 40th, but our 50th! Yes, it's our 50th anniversary here. So thank you so much for celebrating with us today and throughout the rest of the year. Iron Science Teacher is based on the Japanese cooking show Iron Chef, in which chefs use special secret ingredients to make incredible meals. And so we're putting our Exploratorium spin on this and asking science teachers to cook up incredible science classroom activities or demos using a secret ingredient. Why do we do this? Because we love the science of everyday things and we applaud great teaching. Can you applaud great teaching folks today? <laughs> complete faith in this audience, complete faith. I should warn you though that the ingredients are not so secret to our contestants, but they are secret to you. So today's secret ingredient is inspired by the Exploratorium's 50th anniversary. What could it be? The anticipation is mounting. Now, amazing audience, I am empowering you to be the deciders because you today are gonna help me crown the Iron Science Teacher Champion. So as the judges, by cheering today, you're gonna let us know who I can then claim has the title of Iron Science Teacher. Can you help me by cheering to let me know who you love the most? Yeah! Awesome, let's meet our contestants today. They are all staff members from the Teacher Institute. First up is Eric Muller. He is the senior science educator here and also is teaching the Physical Science Summer Institute. All right, next up is Desiree Whitmore. She is also a senior science educator and teaching alongside with Eric, the Physical Science Summer Institute. Up third is Lori Lambertson. She is a senior science educator and is teaching the Middle School Summer Institute. Oh, there we go. Already the audience is starting to pick their favorite. Impressive. And last but surely not least is Julie Yu. She is a senior scientist and is teaching alongside Lori in the Middle School Institute. Okay, high school teachers, you're, you're like not doing well here. These middle school teachers are excited. High school teachers, let me hear you. All right, contestants, are you ready to reveal the secret ingredient behind you? It's, there you go. You gotta move around. Yes, they're, they're slow today, folks. Okay, give them a round of applause for moving, yes. All right, the secret ingredients the contestants will use to cook up science activities is going to be things that are related to gold, or technically golden or goldish. But if you happen to have gold bars, feel free to give them to me and I'll give them back to you in another 50 years. So these amazing science teachers are going to pick from these, act these golden or gold-ish items and then create an activity that uses that theme. Contestants, you're gonna have five minutes to prep. Are you ready, contestants, science teachers? You have five minutes, get ready. On your mark, get set, make some science, go! Audience, help them please, I need some help. All right, as they are getting ready, I wanna let you know a little bit more about the summer institutes that are going on. We have teachers from around not only the country but also the world participating in and committing to three weeks of intense science learning. How are the summer institutes going, folks? All right. 
We're gonna check in on our science teachers in a second and see what they're up to. Oh, that one's mine. This one. First up, we have Eric over here on my right. He has been here for 24, can you believe it, 24 of the 50 years that the Exploratorium has been around. This is his 24th summer. It looks like he's doing something with some dry ice. Um, he still, after 24 years, has a ton of energy, a ton of excitement, but he is a little bit clumsy. No, don't, 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 don't! Oh, jeez. Okay, so those of you in the front, I want to warn you, he's a little bit clumsy. Can someone let HR know that Eric is performing today? That would be helpful. Thank you, Eric. Moving on to Desiree. Desiree is our new physicist here at the Exploratorium. Give it up. This is her first time on the stage. She loves lasers and is known as Dr. Laser Chick. And I'm certain that she is laser focused on winning the title of Iron Science Teacher today. She seems to be doing something with a clear liquid, some beakers, and her lasers, carefully making sure that those lasers don't get in anyone's eyes. Thank you, Desiree. So glad you're here. Lori Lambertson loves the water, but has some water in a cup, it looks like, but also something fishy is going on. What is that? It looks like some sort of fish-filled, orange, goldish, fish-filled application here. Lori herself is an avid surfer and loves to be a s swimmer in the water itself. It looks like she is joining the fish today and trying to show us some science related to water and fish. Thank you so much, Lori. We're excited for this. And last but not least, we have Julie. Julie has not been on the stage as a contestant since 2012. She is, yeah, can we help her out here and be excited for her? There we go. She looks, looks like she knows what she's doing. She has some clear liquid going into some beakers. She has a safety goggles and gloves to make sure. Oh, and it's turning gold. What's happening, folks? Already trying to win points with the audience in this early stage during the prep. All right. Thank you so much. It looks like Julie has a hot plate going as well. And she's adding something in a yellow, that's yellowish into or goldish into a beaker and for what looks like a hot bath. All right. Science teachers, I think we have just a couple more seconds to prep. Are we ready, teachers? I'm getting a nod. Yes, they are. Great. Okay, so let's have all the contestants. If you could go ahead and leave the stage for me, make sure nothing is on that's going to burn, and we'll go ahead and get this started. Okay, audience, are you ready for the competition to begin? Yeah. Our teachers are all prepped. Everyone is safe. No one has lost anything or is hurt. So I think we're ready to go. Let's first up, if you love him, and you know it, I want you to applaud. But if you don't know him, here he is, your first introduction to the Eric Muller. How's it going? Can I pander to the audience, by the way? How's it going, the greatest teachers in the world? Um, hey, so uh, I have this graduated cylinder over here. And inside this graduated cylinder, I have something called an acid base indicator. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw inside that graduated cylinder, I'm going to throw a piece of dry ice. Everybody ready? Let's watch what happens to it. Do you see a color change happening? Yeah. So this solution or the, the, this chemical acid base indicator changes colors in the presence of acid. And I'm going to put a little bit of base in there. Ooh. I think it pretty much just one right there. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, that's gonna leak over, but that's okay. Um, I'll put this right over here, actually. Okay, 
That's it, right? We're all done? You're all done. Okay. Oh, I got to do something with gold, don't I? That would be great. Gold. Okay, got it, got it. Gold. Um, okay, gold, 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 gold. Okay, I have this stuff here called goldenrod paper. Ooh, goldenrod paper. Um, goldenrod paper is really cool stuff. Um, you might have goldenrod paper um, at your school site. It's not as common as it used to be, but you might have some stash and some stationary area in your school. If you can find goldenrod paper, you should go find it and you should use it. Great stuff. Just to let you know, there's other stuff they also call goldenrod, but it is not goldenrod. The interesting thing about goldenrod paper is it has a special ingredient in it, and it's just really cool because... I, I think I cut myself. I got a paper cut? Wait, you have a paper cut? I think I got a paper cut, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. What are I you talking about? It's, it stings a lot, and uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think I'm doing okay. I think, I think I'm going to be okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, hold on. Hold Okay, I'll, I'll get another piece of paper because I, okay. Um, it really sings a lot, it sings quite a bit, yeah. Um, so um, the interesting thing about goldenrod paper is that it, um, it has a real, uh-oh. Hey, does anybody have like a tourniquet or something? <laughs> this is, uh, this is getting bad over here. Okay, um, so there is an interesting thing, thing about goldenrod paper. I think I'll finish this before I pass out, by the way. Okay. So the interesting thing about goldenrod paper is that, um, uh, tell you what, let, let me see if I can clean this off. Let me uh, see if I can clean this off somehow. I have a, a wipe over here. Let me see if I could wipe this off and get rid of some of that uh, red color there. Let me uh, see if I can get rid of that, because this, this is getting kind of gross over here. So it turns out that goldenrod paper has an ingredient there that is an acid-base indicator. And so, you thought I was bleeding, didn't ya? Huh? So the, oh, isn't that cool? Gone away. So, thank you very much. <laughs> so the interesting thing is over here, I don't know if you saw me, I took some base over here and I put my finger in it. And if you put base on your goldenrod, you could splatter some blood on there. Oh, almost. Oh, almost, almost got it there. Base, and if you want to change it back, right over here, I have some acid. This is vinegar. This is cleaning solution. This is just ammonia, weak ammonia solution. But you can take your, oh, act actually, your acid over here. This is the vinegar, and you can get rid of your base. So, goldenrod paper, acid base indicator. <laughs> goldenrod. All right, thank you, Eric Muller. Amazing, another round of applause, please. And can someone let HR know that we are not in fact bleeding? That would be great, we appreciate it. Up next, her first time on the Iron Science stage, we have Desiree Whitmore. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Are we ready for some awesomeness? All right. We are gonna play with color because I was thinking if the secret ingredient is gold, maybe I can make liquid gold. Have you ever seen liquid gold? No? All right. We're gonna try right over here. So my first idea is, okay, what does gold look like? Like what's the closest color that we know to gold? Yellow, Yellow right? So here, just gonna put a couple drops of yellow in there so that we know what color we're looking for. I'm gonna stir it with a box cutter. <laughs> okay, so does this look like gold? Yeah, roughly, yeah, okay. Well, fine. I'm gonna think about, I've been learning here about all of the different ways that you can mix colors to make other colors. So I think that there are two colors you can mix together to make gold. Do you guys know what colors those might be? I have red, I have green, and I have blue. So if I want to pick two of them, which ones do you think I can pick? 
green and blue? I mean, blue and yellow makes green, right? So maybe green and blue make yellow? What do you think? No? OK. What about red and blue? That makes purple, somebody says? Ugh. Well, I don't think I have any more combinations, do I? Yellow, oh, red, and green? OK, OK. Let's try some red and green. So I'm going to put boop, two drops of green in there. And I'm going to put two drops of red in here. So now I have beautiful green solution. And I have a beautiful red solution, yes? OK, so these should mix together to make yellow, right? That's what you guys told me. I'm listening to you, OK? <laughs> All right, so there's my yellow over there. That's the color I want. Are we ready? Yeah. All right, we're going to make gold, liquid gold. Ready, go. That's not gold, you guys. You told me it was going to be gold. I'm new to this. I don't even know what I'm doing. OK, so this is not gold, obviously, right? What color is this? Brown, maybe black, gray, yeah? That's unfortunate, because I thought that I was mixing colors, right? And I wonder why that might happen. And I think I figured it out. I think I figured it out, OK? Now, light has three things it can do with materials, right? It can be transmitted. So like the light coming through here maybe looks like it's yellow. But that doesn't mean that yellow light's transmitting. I'm using white light, right? Yeah. OK, so that's not transmitting. Here, you can see white light transmitting, OK? Here, a second thing light can do is reflect. So here, I put yellow food coloring inside. And that happens to reflect all of the yellow light from the white out to your eyes. But what happens to all the other colors? They get absorbed. So all of that light goes into, these, goes into the water, into the molecules, right? So then if I have green, that means I'm absorbing all the other colors except for green, including red. And if I have red, I'm absorbing all the other colors except for red. So then when I mix them together, it's absorbing all of the colors, including red and green, and I get black. And that is not what I want. I want liquid gold. So I have an idea. I'm going to use light instead, OK? So if I can somehow get the light into the water, then I can make the water mix together, and that will make me gold. Yeah? What do you think? Yeah. No? Yeah, maybe. We're going to try it, OK? So now. I'm going to turn on my handy dandy laser over here. OK, so I'm putting the laser here. Now, each of these bottles has a hole in the front. OK, you see there's a little hole right there. You can see it right there. OK, and what I'm doing is I'm aligning my laser through the back of the bottle right at that hole. OK, I'm going to do it with a green laser. Uh Oh, is it close to you? Let's see. Oh, it's back there. OK, I'm going to have to move my table a little bit like this. OK, are you OK now? OK, actually, right there. OK, so now, again, I'm aligning to my hole. OK, so we're good. Do you think I'm going to be able to get water or light out? Yeah, no, maybe? OK, we're going to check it out. OK, I'm going to. First, let out the red light. Whoa, look at that. Do you see that? That is actual red light coming through my water. This is a property that's called total internal reflection. So the water travels way faster inside of the water. The light travels. Oops. There we go. The water travels faster. The light travels faster in the water than it does in the air, so it gets stuck inside the water. It can't get out. So now, if I mix these two together, maybe I can actually make, oh, can we turn down the lights, actually? I think I made some golden light, you guys. OK. I can even pop in this little thing here so you can see it even better, perhaps. Whoops, 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 whoops. Look at that. Is that golden? What do you think? 
Yeah, yeah? All right, and that is my golden, my liquid gold. All right. Thank you, Desiree. Impressive. We're going to move Desiree off to the side, so bear with us for one second. But what do we think, audience? Eric or Desiree so far? Oh, we're, we're not sure, it sounds like. We're a little bit hesitant, huh? Well, what do you think about Lori Lambertson? Here she comes, folks. All about the gold. <laughs> I'm done. No. Um, so when, um, when it was revealed that we, uh, our secret ingredient was gold, I was like, gold, gold, what's gold around here in our museum? What exhibits do we have about gold things? Well, you know what? We have goldfish here. So, um, oh, yeah, I got some other kinds of goldfish too. Um, and uh, these goldfish live here at the museum. And uh, one of the things we've been practicing here in the Summer Institute is we've been doing a lot of noticing. And I have some teachers that are going to come up and do some noticing for me. So can my volunteers come on up? All right. Okay, volunteers, let's get to know you. Tell us your name and where you teach. My name is Sarah, and I teach in Daly City, California. Daly City, California, y'all! All right, talk to us, your name and where you teach. My name is Tori, and I teach in Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, Tennessee! Thank you for joining us. And so um, I, uh, I asked Tori and Sarah if they would come up and notice some things about my goldfish. So what do you notice? Well, you know the story. This one has really big eyes. Yeah, so uh, this goldfish has really big eyes. They are both the same species. There are over 200 ver varieties of this species of goldfish. This guy, he seems to be hanging out on the gravel. He really likes that gravel. Yeah, so uh, the black goldfish, um, his nickname is Sinky. This guy's coming up towards the top. Mm. So the gold the golden colored fish, that's swimmy. <laughs> oh, he likes to swim a lot. I notice he's swimming with his fins. So swimmy can swim around. What else? It also Sorry. I thought they were goldfish, but Sinky looks like he's black with like a little bit of gold, but mostly black. Yeah, so they are the same species, just different hybrids of the same species. I notice he seems to be like licking or like doing something on the bottom. The sinky guy. Mm. Yeah, so, um, right. So we're going to talk. Anything else you wanted to notice? They're it both like having a quiet day. Yeah, they're just chilling on the bottom right now. But when Sinky was moving, it looked like he was like moving his whole body like <laughs> to try and get somewhere. Whereas like Swimmy was just being like, right, ha! Hold so, by. like, Sinky has to work a little harder to move around, especially to go upward. So, um, thank you very much for your noticing, Sarah and Tori. Thank you so much, teachers. And so, our favorite question is, what do you notice? Because there are no wrong answers to that question. But now you might be thinking, well, I wonder, how come Sinky has to work so hard to get to the surface? while Swimmy can just kind of like really easily move throughout the water column. This has to do with the buoyancy of the fish. And so um, it turns out the density of a fish is greater than the water in which it lives. And so fish have to have some way of compensating for the fact that they are actually denser than water. And they have an organ in their body called a swim bladder which is a gas-filled pocket that allows them to stay neutrally buoyant, whether they're up near the surface or if they want to descend. Sinky suffered from an infection to his swim bladder, and so his swim bladder doesn't function properly. Lucky for him, he's at the Exploratorium where he's getting good care. They have to feed him special food that sinks. 
He has to eat sinky food. <laughs> but let's talk a little bit about the science of what's going on. So I told you that the swim bladder is a gas-filled chamber inside the fish. And a lot of people, and if you read this on the internet, you'll, you'll, it'll say, well, it's like a balloon. And the fish, uh, they breathe through their gills. They breathe water, but they're able to extract oxygen from that water. And that oxygen can, be, can diffuse into the swim bladder as a gas through capillaries uh, and fill the swim bladder with more or less air. It's mostly oxygen in the swim bladder. So you'd think, oh, well, in order to float, they must put more gas in, decreasing the density of the overall fish, and up it goes. Or if they want to sink, they take some of that gas out, reabsorb the oxygen, and then the fish would sink again. It says that a lot on the internet. Don't trust everything you read on the internet. A lesson to all. So what I'd like to talk a little bit about is why is that like, not the right explanation? Well, we live at sea level. We live in air. We live in this fluid. And the pressure of the atmosphere weighing down on us right now is 14, about 14 pounds per square inch. And my, uh, my colleague Eric likes to show people just how much that is, because this is a 14-pound bar. And it has a cross-section of a square inch. And if you put this like on your toe, it's kind of like, oh, that's, that's the weight of the atmosphere over a square inch. Um, it feels like it's a lot of weight right now on my toe. Well, I'm having that pressure right now on my hand. All of you are. But it's going in every direction. The atmosphere pushes this way and this way and this way and this way. And so we don't notice it. We live under that pressure. But when you go under water, Every 33 feet down you go increases the pressure by one atmosphere. So it's like this feeling when you go down 33 feet, the feeling that I have on my toe right now. But again, it's going to be in all directions again. But what does that pressure do to the fish? And I have something I can pass around so you can experience this. I'm not going to pass this bar around because that's uncomfortable. But I did some mathematics because mathematics is the language of science. And um, I did a calculation for what would be the pressure just over a square centimeter. And I put that amount of water in this bottle. So I'm going to pass this around so you can feel what does one atmosphere feel like just on that one little square made a dent in my hand. So I'm going to pass that around. And um, I'd like to uh, show you a fish swim bladder. Wait, there's more. Really, I am. I'm going to do a dissection right now. What? I am. I'm going to do a dissection. So I went to the fish market. Are what about Realia here now? And Give me a round of applause for the fishes, please. Well, I actually, I pre-dissected it. And um, what I wanted to tell you is whenever we do dissections, we like to give respect to the animals for whom... We are from whom we are learning. And so I am respectfully dissecting these fish so we can learn something about the swim bladder. And um, I first wanted to show you the fish gill. So I dissected them a little bit differently. So I cut away the gill cover, which is called the operculum. And you can see inside the fish's gills. And they look. There they go. They look really feathery. Very, very high surface area, just like the alveoli of the human lung. So water passes into the fish's mouth, through the gills and out this covering, and they are able to extract the oxygen from the water through this high, high surface area, uh, these gills. So now we have oxygen in the fish's blood because they need oxygen in their blood just like we do. But they have this specialized chamber. And I cut away this fish a little bit differently so we can see the gas bladder, the fish swim bladder. So way up inside here, you can see there's a pocket of air. See that right there? It's a little like a little balloon. I can push it. See that? 
there's a little air pocket up inside the fish. And look where it's located, right up here underneath the spine. That makes it so with the air belt bladder right up here by the spine, it keeps the fish in this upright position. That's why when fish aren't doing so well, they go a little sideways. So, but let's talk a little bit about how that swim bladder works. Thank you, fish. Thank you, fish. Thank you, respectfully. Learning from our fish. My, my buddy Eric Muller has this activity called Condiment Diver. And so I made some little condiments out of little itty bitty condiments that you get soy sauce in sometimes. And I filled them with gold liquid. They all have some air bubbles in them. So I can't mimic what underwater pressure is like unless I can add pressure to something. And this bottle is filled completely with water and I can squeeze on this bottle, but water's not compressible. The only thing that's compressible in this bottle is the little air bubble inside my little plastic fish. So all of them have little air bubbles. And so if I squeeze this, Eric. Sometimes I can't squeeze it hard enough because I don't have very much hand strength. So there's a floating fish up here. And so Eric is changing the pressure of that bottle. It, water is not compressible. The only thing that can change in there is that tiny air bubble inside my plastic fish. And so it's like, oh, it's decreasing in volume. It changes the density of the fish, and the fish sinks. That's not how real air bladders work. If that happened to a real fish, as it went deeper and deeper, that air pocket would get smaller and smaller, and the fish, because of pressure, because of pressure, and the fish would just sink, 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 and not be able to recover. It turns out, as the fish descends, it has to put more air in the air bladder because it's being squeezed more. So to stay neutrally buoyant, fish add air to the swim bladder as they go down, and they take the air out as they go up. Otherwise, they would explode as they came up to the surface. Any of you who've done scuba diving know how this works. I don't know about scuba diving, but I know about fish, because these are my friends in the ocean when I go surfing. Thank you. That's swim bladder. All right. One more round of applause for Lori and Swimmy and Sinky. Okay, folks, we're up to our last competitor. She hasn't been on this stage as a contestant for seven long years. Give it up, please, for Julie Yu. Thank you, that was very generous. Um, give me just one second. How's everyone doing? So early alchemists were fascinated by the idea of being able to transform one metal into another. Specifically, some com something more common, such as lead, into something more precious, such as gold. So earlier, when I took a look at the gold items, nothing really caught my eye, to be honest with you. And I thought, you know what? Maybe I should try to turn lead into gold. That'd be pretty amazing, right? Like the most amazing. So I have two solutions here. One is a lead-based solution, lead nitrate. And you can see that it's clear in color. And the other is potassium iodine, another clear solution. When I mix the two, maybe you saw this earlier, but I want you to take a close look at what happens. Very slowly, two clear solutions turn a color that is no longer clear. It's kind of pearlescent, and I, I, that's gold-ish, but to me, I might, just to be fair, I might call that yellow, right? It's a little sparkly, I might call it yellow. Now, what happens here is a reaction takes place. We know that because it turned a color. 
and it's a classic, in chemistry we call this a double displacement reaction. Two solutions went in that are basically pairs of ions and then they swapped partners. And so this yellow colored precipitate, this yellow colored solid that came out of solution is lead iodide. Now lead iodide has a pretty fantastic property in that its solubility, how well it dissolves in water, is very dependent on temperature. You can see here at room temperature, it's not dissolving, so it's a solid. Maybe you saw me put my pre-mixed lead iodide into the hot water bath earlier, and you can see that once you heat it up, it actually dissolves. Its solubility gets much higher, and it becomes a clear solution. Now this is where the magic happens. Earlier, I preheated a solution of lead iodide and then let it cool slowly. And you can see here that now, I'm gonna shine the light just so folks in the audience, you can see how sparkly that is? I think I've made at least some golden flakes. So, that's pretty fantastic, yeah. The thing about lead iodide is it has a hexagonal crystal structure. So if it can cool slowly, you get these big hexagonal flakes that can reflect light. And so I would say that this lead is now very golden. However, I did not succeed in turning this lead into elemental gold, right? This is now just a lead in a different format. I want to say, though, that um, I have a bit of a confession. You know, earlier this year, this idea of alchemy came up at the Exploratorium, and I was very skeptical. I said, should we really be talking about this thing that most people think of as pseudoscience? Um, and you know what? It turns out the alchemists were amazing experimentalists. The practices and tools that they used really became the precursors to modern chemistry. And so part of science sometimes is that your hypotheses and your ideas turn out not to be correct or turn out to be unattainable or unachievable by you know, what we, our current understanding. And so the alchemists didn't quite reach their goal of transmuting lead into gold chemically. However, about 30 years ago at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, just across the bay here, there were um, some physicists who tried to do it physically. So the thing that makes elemental gold different from any other element is the number of protons it has. It has 79, and lead has 82. So they didn't use lead. They actually went one more over to bismuth, which has 83 protons. And they used a particle accelerator to smash out four protons from the bismuth to turn it into gold, and they succeeded. They were able to make a few atoms at gold. It cost them for that amount of gold, a trillion times the cost of gold at that time, but they were able to do it. Based on the modern understanding of how we define lead and gold, they were able to do it. So it was um, a good, I mean, uh, apologies to the early alchemists and their basic idea came true, which was pretty fantastic. Um, before I go, you know, Jessica said I hadn't competed for a while because I actually went into retirement. And so for one time only, I'm back on the stage. And I was just wondering, if can, can we document this? Is that okay? Okay, so maybe all the teachers, can you just, I'm gonna maybe selfie camera, everyone say gold. gold! Okay, and so here's the thing. It is the 50th anniversary of the Exploratorium, the 50th anniversary, and um, <laughs> I, I gotta make sure our host doesn't faint here. So this morning, I resurrected a Twitter account that someone had made for me um, a while ago. And this is not just, sorry, um, see, it's very, <laughs> how does this work? Technology is hard, people. Uh, Technology is hard. Yes. Um, so this is the 50th anniversary of the Exploratorium, but the 0th anniversary of my first social media tweet. So if you, you know, we've been doing this show for 20 years, and like all of you folks online out there, here is your chance to vote. So Ron's helping me. I'm going to tweet. I am at ExploJulie. What do I do? Go here. Uh, so take a look. There's the tweet. 
at Expo Julie, retweet your vote. Thank you so much and cheers to all the teachers here. All right. So audience, we're gonna bring out these contestants to see which one you think should be crowned the Iron Science Teacher of 2019. Let's bring out Eric who now is no longer bleeding. Here he is, Eric Muller. Eric, come on over here, please. He is going to remind us that he used goldenrod paper with an acid-based indicator to make HR very upset. <laughs> yes, all right, thank you, Eric. Let's remember Desiree Whitmore. She showed us how the total internal reflection of light leads to color mixing. All right. Let's bring out Lori and her fishes. <laughs> Lori showed us how fish have an air-filled sack to be more buoyant. And she might share those, I think, in order to get a vote, I, I think. Yeah, there we go. And last but not least, our senior scientist, Julie Yu. <laughs> She was trying to make lead look like gold and then used a social media vote to cheat. All right. Now I need you. Don't try that. Uh, please don't try. You can eat the goldfish at home. You cannot try this at home, okay? We got it? Lasers at home, but not in your eye. Don't do this at all. It scares everyone. Okay. What do I have? I have a sound level meter, people. Remember, you are the deciders today. So I am gonna go through, I've turned it on. Can I check and double check that it's on? Give me a big drum roll, please. Okay, that, that was really pathetic. It didn't even pick it up. Let's do it one more time. Drum roll, please. Amazing, amazing. So when I go over each, a contestant, your applause will tell me in decibels how much you like them. And then, according to that, Ron and I will check in and determine and crown Iron Science Teacher Champion for 2019. Are you ready, audience? Yeah. All right, what do you think about Eric Muller? Yeah. Okay, okay, that was great. But what do you think about Desiree Whitmore? Ron, did you capture that? I, I, had, I had evidence, okay. What do we think about Lori and her fishies? <laughs> All right, impressive. And last but not least, Julie and her social media. I, I need to confer with Ron, I need to confer with Ron. Is this our first ever tie? I, with Julie I and think Desiree? It was Julie. You would think, okay. We thought we had a tie between the rookie on the stage and our senior scientist, but it turns out it's Julie Yu! <laughs> that, don't try the social media vote at home, folks. Okay, can we give another round of applause, please, to our teachers, all of them? They are all winners in my book because they love everyday science and they love to teach and learn. So thank you. A reminder to you all, thanks so much for coming and watching online. Join us again next Friday, June 28th, same time, same location, where we have four teachers from leadership, middle school or high school competing for the rights of the Iron Science Teacher Championship. Happy Friday and continue to explore the natural world around you. Take care, all. Woo!